Hello everyone, welcome to lecture 12 and 13. Um, so last week we have talked about culture of poverty and also relationship between social positions such as gender and race um, and poverty. And this week we are going to focus on sort of spatial and geographical factors of poverty. Um, so for the first part of this lecture, I'm going to talk about rural poverty. Um, actually, um, rural poverty is such a complex issue um, with many layers in it. Um, so I decided to just start with my own story, my own story um, in my field site in Dachinkali, Nepal. So as I have previously mentioned, uh, my own field work as a cultural anthropologist is in um, semi-rural Kathmandu Valley, a place called Dachinkali. So you can see this picture as one of the viewpoint of my field site. Um, so Dachinkali is located um, towards the hill area um, that surrounds the Kamandu Valley. So you can actually see that um, there's a lot of agricultural um, field, but there are also increased um, housing and settlements. And this is all along um, the built roads um, that links all the way um, out of Kamandu Valley. So this is a pair of um, mother son living in Dachinkali. Um, and the mother's name is Sunita, and then um, the son's name is Ram. So um, they have been farming for generations. So Ram continues to farm um, um, nowadays, even though some of um, his friends in the village have already migrated to the Gulf countries and Malaysia to work as migrant workers. So if you talk to Sunita, uh, what has been the changes um, throughout her lifetime in the village. She will talk to you about how um, the rainfall patterns are have been changing, um, that there is much less rainfall nowadays, and also how the aquifer has been drying, um, the groundwater level has decreased. And this is kind of common and expected, especially when um, um, the place is located near um, Kathmandu, where there has been a growing population, um, urbanizations, and um, a lot of the urban residents are actually using groundwater. So um, groundwater depletion uh, is not surprising, but um, the changing rainfall patterns really points to um, the issue of climate change. Um, even I myself have experienced um, several um, delayed monsoons um, in Nepal and also very extreme climatic events such as uh, non-stop rainfall for many, many days that cause flooding and um, damage to properties and take lives away. But then Sunita, probably as a mother who took care of her children, also talk a lot about how the food tastes is changing, has been changing, and also how the nutrition level of um, the food consumed nowadays um, is not as good as um, what they consumed in the past. So um, she was saying that how the food that's being brought from the market um, is hardly tasty and hardly nutritious, and you need to eat a lot of them and you still don't feel strong. Compared to in the past, she just need to eat a little and she feels strong the whole day. So this is literally what she said. And this is of course due to the different varieties of um, vegetables or food they are being consumed nowadays um, because nowadays um, with the emphasis on productivity, um, people are using um, different kinds of um, seed varieties to grow food to ensure productivity. And um, those food has a much um, inferior quality um, compared to um, food people use to grow for subsistence purposes. And Sunita will also talk about changing soil quality and lowering productivity. So how over the years she felt that um, the soil condition is not as good anymore. Um, and she kind of um, tell me herself that she thinks it's because of years of fertilizer using. So despite all this, right, um, Sunita's son Ram is actually kind of a prominent farmer who is very active uh, in the community uh, farming's work. 
Um, so for example, he participated actively in um, the Chicago Sustainable Farmer School. So this is a picture of the farmer school and it was built around 2012. And the buildings that you are seeing here are actually uh, made entirely out of bottles, um, glass bottles that uh, people collected um, from restaurants, um, garbage dump and other places. And um, using um, other materials like mud and um, earth material and also um, straws, um, they have made um, the entire structure. And then um, this structure has endured uh, um, endure the 2015 earthquake of Nepal. And they, are, they were still um, standing, they are still standing there. Um, and then um, this farming school has actually a lot of um, consider innovative and new technology that um, they were using um, for demonstration purposes to um, farmers around the village. So for example, they have um, solar power irrigation system, they have drip irrigation system, they have composting toilets, and um, they have um, plastic porn for rainwater harvesting. And then they are really trying to promote organic farming as much as they can. So I'm thinking since um, the farming farmer school looks so innovative and environmental friendly, they must be learning all about sustainable farming and organic farming from the school. So I asked Ram, are you doing organic agriculture? So the answer by Ram is that, oh, I am very aware of the um, health impact of using herbicides and pesticides, but fully organic cultivations and practices um, are simply um, not possible because the productivity is too little. I have to ensure that I have sufficient productivity um, to support my livelihood. This sentiment is kind of echoed by um, different farmers um, in the area. Um, so what they were doing is they are trying to slowly transition um, some of the um, inorganic fertilizers to organic fertilizers using composting methods and try to use more organic ways of um, trapping insects and, and pests. And then regarding local seeds, even though um, he's aware that um, um, actually, everyone is aware that the local seeds variety will produce better quality food, but the productivity is very unpredictable and um, is usually produced in too small a quantity and is a risky venture to take for farmers who or, who plan to earn their livelihood through farming. They actually um, propagate the use of hybrid seeds and, and they, they love hybrid seeds because it gives them predictable productivity some of them still use local seeds only for their home garden, so only for their own consumption. And also they mentioned how um, local seeds are not um, possible in supporting off-season farming. Some of the experts actually are aware that um, the hybrid seeds will cross-contaminate local seeds and make local seeds variable worse and worse because um, they believe that it is only by modernizing and um, making agriculture profitable um, as wage labor that it is possible to retain the people back in the village to support the social and community reproductions. So even when they can ensure productivity, another risk here is actually the volatile market prices. And I have heard a lot of complaints about this from the villagers about how um, sometimes the prices are so low that they cannot earn anything and they actually lose money. And also some farmers from more remote areas will complain about how middle person will come over and collect their products with even a much lower prices. So um, a better way is for them themselves to go to the market um, and sell those goods, but this is not always possible. So in the farmer's opinion, since um, they are unable to control um, price policies, um, they feel that actually productivity is the key because this is something that at least they can control or they can try to control. That's why they don't want to take risk of using entirely organic farming or using local seeds. And also some of them are, who are more innovative will um, talk about how we can actually grow different kinds of um, products such as one of them, uh, a women farmer will grow flowers and then bring the flowers to temple to sell by herself and that, that, goods, that brings very good profit. 
So this is a slideshow taken from the World Bank website, which tells us that 78% um, of poor people live in rural areas and work mainly in agriculture, so they must be lifted out of poverty. So remember I was saying rural poverty has multiple layers, so I would like to use onion as a metaphor here. Um, if you look at the major reports or um, websites of um, development actors who work on agriculture and rural poverty, they talk about um, how the landless people who have no access to land tenure and ownership um, are actually those who are poorest of the poor because they have to work for other people and then um, pay them in terms of a uh, majority of the harvest products and they don't have any um, entitlement to um, services such as irrigation services or uh, loans from the bank. And also many would say that all oh, these farmers are lack of access to modern technology so um, they are productivity is not sufficient um, to cover um, their livelihood needs. And they will talk about how um, a lot of the farmers don't have access to market. Um, and also they will talk about the underinvestment of rural infrastructure, which is very true because a lot of the investments uh, tend to be um, focusing in the city areas because the population is growing and bigger there. And then you will see that most of the um, rural areas, um, the more remote you are, the more difficult to find health services or school services or other kind of public services. Some of these development actors also talk about how rural poverty actually intersects with class and gender poverty. But I would like to argue that this is only um, the first layer of problems that they were talking about. And what, are, what is the second layer exactly? So when you talk about land tenure and ownership, the concurrent phenomena is that you can observe a lot of rural urban migrations um, to the extent that there are a lot of abandoned farmlands. And um, this abandoned farmland, sometimes they are being leased to landless farmers or to other farmers to work on them. Um, but most of the time, they are being held by the, the migrants in their hands until they find very good price to sell them. The other farmers cannot pay as much for a piece of land, and, but land developers can pay that. Maybe pay it to build a hospital, to build a school, or um, to build a market, shopping mall, um, whatever it is, right? So you can see that um, this concurrent phenomenon of urban migrations might actually um, um, cause this land tenure problem to persist or even worsen it. And then um, when you talk about lack of access to modern technology, um, you can look at neighboring India, uh, which has um, a lot of farmers with access to technology, but committed farmer suicide because they are in debt um, after a failure of crop um, because they have paid so much um, in terms of um, doing farming. They have to pay for the pesticide, herbicide, seeds, and fertilizer. And once there's a drought or there's a crop failure, um, they cannot repay it. And a lot of them um, actually committed suicides. And we talk about this also um, in our last um, week lectures. And I also um, uh, direct you to a video by NDTV about um, farmer suicides in India. So when you talk about lack of access to market, you also can see that there are many studies um, telling how nutrition of villages will actually deteriorate as they have more access to market. Um, because a lot of the times the market or the transportation access actually brings um, consumer products to the villages much more than they bring uh, the villages products to the urban area. Um, so a lot of um, people start to rely on um, food products that they can purchase in the market um, for convenience purposes but also um, display a kind of status because when you can buy um, biscuits it will look much more high class um, than a fresh corn in a village setting for example so um, you can actually see deteriorating nutrition and food security and this is coupled with um, labor out migration and labor shortage in terms of agricultural production right and also um, access to market does not solve the volatile market prices problem 
because a lot of the farmers are still worried about having a very low prices for their food products, even when they have good productivity. So this concern and this anxiety is always there. And then we have food security issue, right? When you have access to market, you start to grow things uh, that is not consumed by yourself. You have start to grow everything that is cash crop so that you can sell them and then um, get the profit and use it to buy things that you need um, for self consumptions. But if the market prices are bad or if something happens and your crops fail, you haven't even had um, your own food crops to feed yourself. So this actually increased the risk of um, food insecurity.